Wednesday, April the 7th. Good to be with you this morning. Hope you're doing well. I am doing well myself. A little tired today, but that seems to be the normal routine every day. Um, it's good to be with you. I uh, want to encourage you to continue to be praying for Kim Crawford, uh, Kim and John's granddaughter, who's five, and she's been diagnosed with COVID and have not heard an update on her, but continue to pray for her, if you will. And this morning, I want to ask you to pray. You remember I had shared that uh, three or four weeks ago, Gary and Glenda Smith had had an automobile accident, a head-on collision on the way to church. Uh, the, the car was just totaled, a mess. Glenda had broken her ankle, and um, Gary had been banged up. And emotionally, it's really hard for Gary. This is like his second major accident. The first one kind of... Um, left him in bad shape. But anyway, as a result of that, going to the hospital, they discovered uh, a spot on Glenda's kidney. And further examination, there was a spot on each kidney. Well, the spot on one of her kidneys is larger than what they expected. So they're scheduling her to have surgery. Uh, I think they're going to remove the kidney, one of her kidneys. And so be praying for her. Uh, I don't know the scheduled date of that. Barbara had placed that information on Facebook and then texted it to me this morning. So just be praying for Glenda. She has this upcoming surgery and pray that there be complete healing and no continued, um, uh, no continued treatment after that. Mm. And so I want to remind you also that tonight is our first and foremost prayer, corporate prayer at 6 p.m. in the sanctuary. And so come either in person or online and participate in our corporate prayer tonight, if you will, first and foremost. This morning, we're going to begin looking at um, Galatians. It's where I've moved to in my quiet time, and we're only going to cover a few verses. But it was a perfect song that kind of fit these opening verses that Paul writes, the opening in Galatians. Oh, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch I hear. I once was lost, oh, but now.
My chains are gone and I've been set free. Aren't you glad that God has freed you from the, uh, from the penalty, the judgment, the wrath of your sin? He's giving you the power to overcome and there's forgiveness today and tomorrow for our sins. Uh, thank God for that this morning. Oh, turning to the book of Galatians, beginning in chapter 1, just a little background on Galatians first. Paul writes this letter probably around 45 A.D., 45 to 50 A.D., early on in the church age to a, a number of churches, we don't know how many, in the area of Galatia, uh, where it's located probably, uh, well, is today what would be modern Turkey. And we know that Paul had gone there. Paul had gone and preached the gospel. He had established churches there. And now sometime later, he writes back to those churches because there were those who were... Um, who were among them teachers within the church who were teaching false doctrine and uh, to bottom line they were they were teaching salvation by grace plus and in their circumstance it was plus circumcision and we still have the same thing that happens today that there are those that preach the gospel but they add other things to the gospel uh, there's only one gospel and paul's going to explain that further as we get on down in the chapter but Paul writes to them, and he's uh, disheartened, you can imagine, because there are those who are, who are falling away in that sense from the gospel that he had preached to them, salvation by grace alone, justification by grace alone. And they were adding to that, and some were then now uh, having that sense that they needed to add to their salvation. Again, we do the same thing today. Anything we add to the gospel... Anything we add to the standard, if you will, of Christian living that's not recorded in Scripture is, is a false gospel. It's another gospel. We uh, sometimes have the idea that we're saved by grace, but we need to do this. And we put those expectations on others. Well, you need to do this. You need to do that. And you need to do all these other things to verify your salvation. And that's just not true. Well, a real Christian wouldn't, okay? Um, so Paul writes here, beginning to correct some of those things within the church. He begins in verse 1 by introducing himself as an apostle. There are those that run around today claiming to be an apostle, uh, but it's not possible. Uh, one had to be an eyewitness of Jesus to be considered apostle in the early church. There's, there's the office of apostleship or the function of apostleship, but the title apostle was only reserved for those who had physically been in the presence of Christ. And of course, we know Paul had. He had met the risen Jesus Christ on the road on his journey to Damascus as he was going out to persecute Christians. And so here, Paul, a Pharisee of all Pharisees, one who was persecuting and, and murdering Christians for their faith, now has seen the risen Christ transform life. He's been born again. And so he begins to state that he's an apostle. And he says, I'm not an apostle from men nor through man. In other words, there was not a man that appointed me to be an apostle. Uh, that can't happen. That's not possible. That's why today we have those that run around calling themselves apostle, or we have those who practice appointing others as an apostle. Can't do it. That's God's appointment. And so he says, not from man nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father. So he was appointed as an apostle by Jesus Christ himself and the Father. And so Paul had uh, better credentials than, than anybody today that would claim to be an apostle. And he says, all and to, uh, who raised him from the dead, we just celebrated that last week. And I think one of the reasons that Paul mentions this here is to affirm the fact that he had met the risen Christ on the road to Damascus. Uh, he affirmed that Christ had risen from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me. So this is just a normal greeting. And he 
writes here in, in a way that he opens most of all, all of his letters, really. It's either in this phrase or by grace and peace from God the Father to you. And so he says, to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God, our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. There's no other place that grace can emulate from, that unmerited favor. There's grace to them from, from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And peace, Jesus said, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives. There's a peace that we can have that's only from God. We know the difference in, in, in just a, a normal peace and a peace that's from God. A peace that's from God, as the Bible said, is one that passes all understanding. We shouldn't have peace, but we do in the midst of those things. And so here in this opening letter, Paul says to us, grace and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who, speaking of Jesus, who gave himself for our sins. I love that. He gave himself. Nobody took Jesus's life. There were those who were involved in killing Jesus, but no one took his life. He willingly gave his life. The Bible says that the Father gave his Son, but Jesus willingly participated in the plan to lay down his life as a ransom and a payment for our sin. Jesus himself said, no one is taking my life, but I willingly lay it down. And think about that. He who was sinless, God, very God himself, gave his life for your sins and my sins. It never gets old. There's that old, old story. I love to tell the story of God, Jesus, and his love, the hymn writer said. Uh, if, it, if it ever gets old to us, we need to examine where our heart is. You see, we can never, we, we can never get to the place, or we should never get to the place that the reality of Jesus giving his life for our sins becomes old hat, becomes rote. If, if you're kind of there today, then you may need to ask the Holy Spirit to renew that passion and that drive and that realization of Jesus giving his life for your sins, who gave himself for our sins to, in order to, deliver us from the present evil age. Now, that kind of seems odd because they were still in that present evil age. We are still in a present evil age, but he has delivered us from that in the whole orb, from, from the penalty and the wrath that is going to come on this present age when Jesus returns. And so Jesus gave himself for our sins in order to deliver us, to take us out of, in that sense, of the consequences of this evil age. Now, there's another point of that as well, in that when we've been born again, our life has been transformed. We've been given the power of the Holy Spirit, and God transforms our life. He changes our life. We cooperate with him in that, but there's not a one of us that would have a desire to do good if God had not saved us and placed the Holy Spirit in our hearts and lives. We may have lived a good life, but there's not a one of us that would, would have a desire not to practice evil had God not saved us and transformed our lives and given us the Holy Spirit. So to deliver us from the present evil age in accordance to the will of our God and Father. It was God's will, the Father's will, that he would send his Son to be a sacrifice and a payment for our sins, to deliver him up for our sins. And it was also God's will that would not be thwarted. There was not going to be anything that would interfere with that. You know, Sunday mornings we're studying, uh, going through the book of Genesis, the very beginning. And we see all the way back there in Genesis chapter 3 that God had a plan to deliver man from sin. God had a plan to redeem us, to purchase us back unto himself. And as we go through all of the history of the Old Testament, all of those many, many years, God's plan and his will was not thwarted. He was going to see that it happened. 
You know, the application for that in our lives is that whatever God's will and plan for your life and my life is, there's absolutely nothing that can thwart that will. God will bring it to pass. And then he says in verse 5, To whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. That's reason enough to give God glory, to give God worship, to give him honor, and to give him praise. And so today, I want to encourage you, maybe carve out half an hour or so in your day, and go ahead and sit down with the whole book of Galatians and read through it just in one reading today. And then we'll come back every morning and reflectively have some quiet time together, a devotion over the verses that we, that we read and we kind of expound on every day. I pray the Lord blesses you today, that his face would shine upon you. I encourage you to be back tonight, 6 p.m., for our corporate prayer. Uh, may God give us an opportunity to plant a seed in somebody's heart today or to cultivate a seed that's already been planted there. Or by God's grace, he'll allow us to participate and watch him save somebody today. I pray the Lord blesses you and keeps you. I love you. Have a great day. See you tomorrow morning.